Okay, we've been talking last week about a spirit of humility, or Jew humility. How many have been testing on your pride here a little bit lately? <laughs> I'm always a little scared to preach on humility or pride because it seems like every time I do it, I get tested on it. And that's one of the scary things about being a teacher or preacher, if you're not walking it, it'll come back to boomerang and hit you in the rear end. But that's okay, because if it's true, the shoe fits, wear it, amen? But a spirit of humility is about an attitude of carrying ourselves with a, you know, with a spirit or an attitude of just humility. Humility means a state of being humble, an attitude, it's a lowliness of mind, means to be self-abased or to make oneself low. It refers to being a choice. How I many you know we all have a prideful, arrogant, conceited kind of nature that goes with us? <clears throat> it's not if it happens, it's when it happens. We're going to have to learn to recognize it when it's when that thing's on us. Yeah. I mean, you know what that thing is? Uh -huh. That's that thing in us. You know, that when somebody wants to correct us or speak into our life, immediately there's that thing that comes up in us, that defense mechanism, that layers of onion skin that we hide behind, bowing up like a baying rooster to try to prepare ourselves to deal with that rather than just being abased. And when that thing happens, we've got to learn to recognize it and beat ourselves down, abase ourselves, make ourselves low. We have to, you know, our nature is to be that way. So when that nature comes up, we have a new nature, don't we? We have a new nature, a nature of humility, a nature of meekness. It was in Christ. It can also, that same attitude that was in Christ can also be in us. So when that happens, you know, we've got to learn to recognize it and, and, and fight it and oppose it. So all great saints, men of God, Men that have been in the game a long time, in the fight of faith. Uh, men that have outlasted over and over and over again, that have walked with God year in, year out, seasoned. You know, people that, that have been in the game and fought the good fight, one of the common characteristics <coughs> or attitudes <coughs> is a spirit of humility, uh, of true humility. They're able to recognize when that thing comes up in them <coughs> and they catch it, recognize it, and can beat it down and refuse to let it dictate to them. I mean, we've called to be the head and not the tail. That means we're supposed to be above and not beneath. When pride takes us, that puts us below and puts pride above us, and we can't let that happen. We've got to dictate. We've got to be in control. Instead of letting it, uh, you know, dictate to us, we dictate them. It doesn't need to have dominion over. We can have dominion over it because that's who we are. We can, we can beat this game of pride. <clears throat> and so one of the true humilities, if you're going to outlast and be successful, you're going to have to learn to deal with that pride. You're going to have to learn to walk in what we call not a false humility, but a true humility. Characteristics of uh, someone who walks in, in humility is they've got, a, they've got a, a certain inherent meekness about them. Meekness was one of the greatest character qualities of the ancients. They regarded meekness as the highest of all the character qualities. It's the ability to handle yourself exactly the way you need to in every single time. It means to be angry if you have to, but it, it goes to the other extreme. It means to be angerlessness. It means to be shrewd as a serpent, yet gentle as a lamb, or uh, you know, uh, tough as steel and yet soft as velvet. It's the ability to not overreact or underreact, but it's the ability to handle every situation exactly the way you need to every time, to be able to keep your composure, to stay cool as a cucumber. How many of you just despise people like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've walked with the Lord 22 years, and it just those people that just don't get upset, they just don't overreact, they don't underreact, they just keep their, they're just cool as a uh, uh, cucumber. Calm and collected under pressure. It's an inward disposition. It rises up and does for you. It takes over at these times. And it beats itself down. It makes itself abased. It's a teachable spirit. A 
teachable spirit is one who is able to receive and not take correction as rejection. <coughs> not easily offended. It's able to listen and get wiser. Uh, to be able to not be defensive, to be approachable. One who's not arrived and know it all. Someone who embraces spiritual authority, seeks out wise counsel, wants to be accountable, to be teachable. One of the things I know that I know that I know that if you're going to survive in this game of recovery, man, you, you know, uh, you're going to have to have a teachable spirit. I've said it before. Lance asked the question, and they asked me at Duncan, and I'm sure Lee does the same thing at Faith Farms. When you come in, is you know, we, we want to know how teachable you are. I don't think they even know what that really means. But whatever it is, most of them, yeah, 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 you know. How good are you at spiritual authority? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm saying, well, if you're really good with spiritual authority, then why have you been out there smoking crack? How did you lose your job? Why is your wife not wanting to hang out with you? Why are you looking at charges pending and all that? All that's is a all those things are a symptom of a rebellious, independent nature uh, that despises spiritual authority. So if we're going to grow and change and develop and mature as Christians, we're going to have to be teachable. We're going to have to be able to, instead of bowing up like a rooster and putting up those defense mechanisms, we're going to have to learn when people that are sent by God, I'm not talking about any old body, but people that are speaking the truth of love, we've we got to be all ears. We've got to be humble. We've got to put on that. and We've got to say, okay, it might not feel good or, or deal with it, whatever, but I know it's good for me. And so I'm going to drop those walls. I'm going to be approachable. I'm going to receive and listen. And tell me what you got. Bring it on. You know, people that really want to grow and change are like that. They, they, they're humble. They want to receive. There's a certain meekness about it. They take ownership and embrace when they're, when they're, when they're wrong. They, they're quick to say, I'm wrong. My bad. I admit it. They're not know-it-all. They're not too big for their britches. They've never arrived. David in Psalms 51, I didn't put it all up here. Psalms 51, 17. David... Started out as a man after God's heart. How many know you can't be a man after God's heart without having humility? God's never going to say, you're a man after my heart if you're not humble because He even said, Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary, heavy laden, and I will give you a learn, learn, learn meekness, learn humility. I, I am humble. I'm the humblest. Learn from me. Learn that humility from me. And so, David started out as a pretty humble guy. Somewhere he got too big for his britches, didn't he? Got a little arrogant, got conceited, got puffed up. He should have been out in war, hanging out with his men. I don't know how old he was at this time, but he should have known better. Whatever, he, he thought he was above all that, so he decided to stay back home where everybody else was out fighting. The next thing you know, he, he gets to catching Bathsheba up on the roof and Next thing he knows, he falls with her, and then he has her husband murdered, and then he hides it for a whole year. Like he's, like he's, like that's okay, like God doesn't see it. I mean, here's a man after God's heart, and all of a sudden now for a whole year, he hides this sin. He knew, he knew what he did. He knew that he had committed murder, and probably, probably his generals and the people that respected him knew that too. And here he's hiding from sin, and God is plenty patient and merciful. Finally, he sends the prophet Nathan and says, Man, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we know David is busted. And then it says in Psalms 51, David's prayer of pardon or forgiveness or repentance. He finally takes ownership. He finally decides it's time to be teachable. He decides it's time to drop his walls, take ownership of his sin. And he says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. Now, now he's saying, I know what I've done. My sin is ever before you. He's not saying, not only have I sinned against Bathsheba and had Uriah killed and all people, but, but my sin, he says, my sin is against you. Against you and you only have I sinned. He, I love how humble he goes right to the source of his sin. He goes right back to God and says, Man, aside from all these pain, it's you that I've sinned against. You I've offended. It's you that I've grieved. It's you that have quenched the Holy Spirit. 
You're my Lord and Father. I was a man after your heart. You caught to my God. I've sinned against you. And he takes ownership of the sin. Yes, you know, you only have my sin. I've done what is evil in your sight so that you are just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He goes through a series of other things. And in verse 17, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Amplified says, A broken a spirit that is broken down with sorrow for his sin. Humbly and thoroughly repent. There is a genuine heartfelt remorse. David says a broken, not a person that's broke, but a person that is broken that is a, is a humble person. He's contrite. He takes ownership and says, my sin is against you and you only have my sin. There's a genuine heartfelt remorse that comes from the heart. It's a true humility. It's not a false, oh yeah, forgive me, you know. And, I mean, you know, see people get right sometimes they come to me and you can just tell, man, don't even, don't, don't even waste your time. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I can tell you just doing this. And so, don't waste God's time. You know, David takes ownership and he says, uh, you know, a broken and contrite, that kind of heart, God will never reject it. He'll never despise it. Despise it says, listen to this, God will never, ever despise that kind of humility. I don't care how, I mean, come on, David blew pretty bad, didn't he? How many of you murdered somebody? I mean, he, what he, I mean, you think of what he did, that was just, and he cost him his kid. It cost him. He, I don't think he really ever regained his composure, uh, you know, uh, after this. I mean, he got forgave him, you know, and blah, 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 blah. But I don't think he really got back to being fully after man, after God's man, man after God's heart. I don't know. But anyway, he says, that kind of spirit, God says, that kind of spirit God enjoys. He embraces. He'll never reject you. He'll never say, no, nah, get away. In other words, he, his nature is compassionate and forgiving. Anytime you take ownership of your sin and say, my bad, and, and you drop to your knees in humility, it says, God, just, he'll, never, he'll always come right to you and pick you up and say, it's okay and forgive us. That's God's nature. <clears throat> so true humility is not a false humility. True humility is a a true evaluation, an honest assessment about who we really are. It's eliminating two types of people where we eliminate the high person, that high, high opinion, that lofty, elegant, arrogant, elevated, deceitful opinion of thinking we're right or about everybody. We've got to eliminate that guy, the person that we try to make everybody think we're, we are, the person that I'm trying to make myself think I am. It's eliminating the low opinion that self-worth, that Eeyore mentality, that I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm self-pity, no one loves me. Because they're both just as bad. Are you with me? That, that there's a low pride and there's a high pride. Both are pride. So, true humility is just being who I am. I, you might have to be the handsomest, the smartest, or, or whatever. You know, it's just true humility is just saying, I am what I am, man. This is me. I don't have to hide behind fig leaves, I don't have to be G.I. Joe in the jar, I, I am who I am, you got what you want, this is who I am, and, and you just be who God's called you to be, nothing more and nothing less, that's true humility, amen? amen. So tonight I want to talk about the dangers of pride. Let me tell you the two billions. And we have, you've heard about the giants, right? What's that guy, Lance Bob Mumford? Talks about the giants and you know the seven giants or whatever. But the two biggest, for me anyways, and I'm sure they're probably you, is fear and pride. Yeah. Okay, those are the two big ones. You'll probably never get rid of them. You may be you may be dictating and in control of your pride and fear and all that, you know, but you're probably not gonna ever really beat them because it's so much into our nature. But fear, that fear of man, that fear of failure, that fear of rejection. That low self-worth, that, that people-pleasing thing. How many have that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Insecure. I think if we were all honest and really admitted, we'd all been the deep down in, we're just a bunch of hurt little boys in big man's bodies, aren't we? Just terrified that if somebody finds out who we are. It's that fear. Even Elijah calls down fire from heaven, destroys the prophets of Baal. Next thing you know, Jezebel sends words uh, before the day's over, I'll have your head on the platter. And, 
he didn't, he didn't even really hear from her. It was word that came from Jezebel. Next thing you know, he takes that fear. That giant overtakes him. Next thing he's running for his life, he's sitting under a juniper tree, suicidal with a 9 millimeter in his head, saying, take my life, I'm a nobody. There's nobody poor little boy like me. So you got that side, and then we got that pride, that arrogance, that conceit, that awry thing that God just hates. How many of God hates pride? Hates it. But he loves humility. The devil loves pride, but hates humility. Let me read something to you. My name is Pride. I'm a cheater. I cheat you of your God-given destiny because you demand your own way. I cheat you of your contentment because you deserve better than this. I cheat you of knowledge because you already know it all. I cheat you of your healing because you are too full of me to forgive. I cheat you of holiness because you refuse to admit when you're wrong. I cheat you of vision because you would rather look into the mirror than out a window. I cheat you of genuine friendship because nobody's going to know the real you. I cheat you of love because real romance demands sacrifice. I cheat, I cheat you of greatness in heaven because you refuse to wash another's feet here on earth. I cheat you of God's glory because I convince you to seek your own. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. You like me because you think I'm always looking out for your best interests. But how untrue. In actuality, I'm looking to make a fool of you. God has so much for you, I admit, but don't worry. Stick with me and you'll never know. Ouch, 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 ouch. Amen? Amen. I know I'm not. I'm just talking to me tonight, right? Okay, nobody got, nobody's, okay? Nobody has a pride problem or nothing, okay? <laughs> Let's turn to Proverbs 16, 8 tonight. Solomon's a pretty smart guy. In fact, he's very wise. God blessed him with wisdom, but I, don't, I think he probably had to go through a few schools of hard knocks. I mean, that God gives us wisdom, but then wisdom is developed as we learn to deal with things, aren't you? I pray, God, make me wise, Lord. Make me wise, Lord. And then God puts me in a situation where I don't know what to do. Have you ever prayed for patience? <laughs> Give me patience, Lord. Next thing you know, you're impatient. Teach me love. Next thing you know, you're with the guy you want to throw a punch on. <laughs> you know? The way... Be careful what you pray, because you might just get it. But usually, I mean, you know, sometimes God just puts a wear on you, but usually when, you, when, you, when you're praying for pride, He's going to put you in a prideful situation where you're going to have to humble yourselves. If you need wisdom, He's going to put you in yourself where you don't know what to do, because it says... And James, if you don't know what to do, ask. Let God give you wisdom. He's got, he'll teach you wisdom. So God wants you to learn to come to Him in all these things. So when it comes to pride, you know, God, 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 uh, we're going to talk about this, the antidote. Uh, God will help us in these things. So anyway, God gives us Solomon with wherever he learns this. In, in 16, 18, he says, Pride goes before or as a prelude to destruction, or in our case, it's called a relapse. How many of you have ever relapsed before? How many know the cause of your relapse is probably your pride? Somewhere you forgot where you came from, didn't you? Got too big for your britches, like my mama used to say. Son, you're about to get too big for your britches. You thought you arrived. God delivered you. Oh God, oh God. If I fail this time, God, God will never forgive me. I'll never have another program. I'll never be able to. I can't handle it. 
my wife's left me. I've got hepatitis C, and I've got cord, and blah, 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 you know. And next thing you know, you get to Liberty Lodge, and you get a few meals in your belly. You get a nice sleep, get a job, make your most money, and the next thing you know, you get that first paycheck. Then, boom, how soon they forgot. Let me tell you one of the pride, pride comes before falls. It's a prelude. A haughty spirit before stumbling. A haughty spirit is a high minded, lofty, arrogant, puffed up kind of attitude where you get the big head and get too big for your bridges. One of the first steps to going back to relapse is you get prideful. You think you're all right. You don't, you know, you got this. You're, you're not teachable anymore. You've learned everything you need to do. You got all under control. You're ready to go back home. You're ready to do all that. You forget where you came from. And next thing you know, you, you get knocked off your high horse. Then you're eating crow, aren't you? 1 Corinthians 10 12 says, Paul's talking about it. I love these. These two are two of my favorites because they just like, you know, we can just about preach these two scriptures right here in all of recovery and not have to worry about a whole lot of other teachings. I'm giving you one of the best teachings in the world, not because of me, but I'm just taking the, 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 the material here, the tools. I'm giving you tools tonight that'll keep you from relapsing. I'm just giving you the tools. I mean, this is nothing like that. I got all this stuff from somebody else. This came from other people, you know what I'm saying? But I'm going to give you something tonight that will keep you from falling on your butt. Keep you from sticking your foot in your mouth. I'm, I'm giving you something that can save your life. Pride has is, is, is killed people. Ty, how many people, you said, how many people from your, your class in, in Dunklin are dead? How many people did you say? Eight out of eleven. Eight out of the eleven people that Ty went through the program with are dead. Six feet under. People that had the tools, had this teaching, I'm sure, had everything they needed to do, and today they're dead six feet under all because they, they probably got too arrogant, too conceited. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 12, says, therefore, I mean, you know, therefore means in light of everything I've been talking about, therefore, you know, I'm teaching to you, therefore, take all this together, and therefore, so Paul was talking about these different things. And he says, therefore, in light of this, he says, let, let him, who's him? It's not just guys. Him means people. means individual. means those. So let's, let him or let those people who think they stand take heed. You better be careful. Let he who stands, thinks he's all right, take heed because you're about ready to fall. About that time, we feel like we've arrived, we become arrogant, we can become conceited, we become puffed up, we're not teachable, we think we know it all, we get too big for his bridges, we think we're right. You better watch out because you're getting ready to get knocked straight off your high horse. So take heed. That means be proactive, pay attention, recognize pride. See it when it comes, take it, beat it down, possess it, dictate it, control it, dominate it. Take dominion over it. Don't let it dominate you. Pride is defined as an inordinate self-worth. Inordinate means it's inflated. An elevated opinion. Over-exaggerated, exalting characteristic. It sees yourself as high-minded. It means that you're walking on a horse, you're riding a horse, and everybody else is down here to eat. You know, you, it's a, it's a self-righteous, arrogant, puffed up, conceited, high-minded, lofty opinion of yourself. It means to. It means to. See yourself as way up here and in a, in a, a, a superior to everybody out. And, and then you look down and see everybody else is inferior to you. A self-righteous spirit. Have you ever seen somebody that's, you know, 
I mean, a true self-righteous spirit is in denial. They, they really think. They really think. They, were, they really see themselves. Self-righteous spirit is, is, goes with that religious spirit. It's with the Pharisees. The Pharisees walk around, I tithe, I do this, I do this. You know, they, they really thought, they just, they were so deceived and deluded in, in their own minds that they really thought they were up here, they were above reproach, and they could just do whatever they wanted to. That's what a self-righteous spirit is. It sees itself up here and everybody else. They treat it with contempt. That means disdain. They see, they look down on them, saying, oh, you're nothing. And, you know, and they really see that. It's, it's a, when you ever I see that self-righteous spirit, man, I said, man, you know, whew. But you know how I recognize it? So I've never been there, and I've done that, and I'm still there, and I still do that. But I recognize it, and I take ownership of it better. Not all the way, but I'm, I'm getting there, okay? I'm, it's taken me 22 years. I'm still arrogant, prideful, all that. You know, I have to beat myself down. I have to make myself low, self-abased. It's an inordinate, insubordinate, independent, arrived attitude that elevates himself to a position where we become our own God. I mean, you were your own God out there when you was drinking and drugging. You know, I said, what are you talking about? Wait, no, that's what you were doing. You know, God's the supreme authority. Ain't nobody hired him, but yet you thought, you thought that you could be independent of him. Most of us were probably Christians anyway. We knew we were doing wrong. It was that pride. It kept us out there. It's that pride. It's that pride that making our own God, making our own decisions. Not caring about anybody. I, me, my. Gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. All, all my. Finally looked in the mirror one day and I realized what my problem was. I was looking at it. It was me. I my mom. I my daddy. I my father and school teacher. I wasn't I got abused or molested. You know, I mean, those things. Those are real, but by and large, it is what it is. You know, it's me. So God hates pride. That independence. Pride is the root of all sin. And it's the original sin. Most of us think the original sin happened with Adam and Eve, don't we? And how do you know it happened way before that even? Listen to what... Isaiah 14, 12 through 16 says. Talks about Lucifer. I believe he was an archangel. This is where sin started. Verse 12 says, How, how you have fallen from heaven. O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you have been weakened, you have weakened, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, circle that, in your heart. I mean, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I can act all false humility, but you know that pride eventually, you know, the, you know what's in what's in my heart is gonna come out in my talk. I mean, you know, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. I can curb my behavior, I can act, but my true character will, be, will emerge in the heat of battle. My true character will eventually come out. But, listen, but this is key. He said it in his heart. He wasn't just talking. How I many of you sometimes say things, you, you just run in your mouth? You know what I'm saying? I mean, me and God go around. I mean, I say things to God. I mean, you know, I just. I say things flippantly, you know, off the top of my head or to people, or I say things to myself, but I don't really, I know in my heart that I don't really think that or I believe that. But the children of Israel, if you remember right, it says they murmured. They weren't just, you know, talking behind in the tents about Moses so much, but they murmured. When they murmured, it, murmur means to say something in your heart. It means they really mean it. They, they really got to the point where they just despised Moses and hated them. They were speaking in the heart. They were murmuring. Murmuring. I tell you what, you can talk your mouth and God will forgive. But when you start to murmur, when you start murmuring against spiritual authority, when you start murmuring against the man with the man, when you start murmuring against 
uh, authority in any way. You better, you better be real careful. But anyway, Satan, Lucifer, began to say things not just in his head, but he began to weave it into the fabric of his heart, into the nature. It became a root problem. He began to say it in his heart. That means he kept repeating it over. And apparently he murmured and thought about this for who knows how long. But somewhere something happened in his heart. Something changed. He started out good because, how I mean, you know, God don't create nothing. I don't understand how this happened to Lucifer. I don't. I mean, that just that blows my mind. Apparently God allowed it to happen or whatever. But this was, this was the root. The sin right. He began to say in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like them. Woo! That's what he just said. I'm going to make myself just like God. I'm going to make myself like I talk about self-righteous spirit. Nevertheless, you were thrust down to show in the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms? Now real quick, look in, look in Ezekiel 28. This talks about Lucifer. Verse 12. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was in your covering. The Amplified says that you had the full measure and pattern of exactness. Giving the finishing touch to all that constitutes completeness. Think about that. God made a perfect creation out of Lucifer. He emanated light. They say he was not only absolutely beautiful and credit, credit, created with all kinds of stones and precious stones, he was absolutely gorgeous. He was just a, a sight to behold when they plug him in at like Times Square at New Year's Eve and they drop the ball. It's like, <laughs> like a Christmas tree. Oh, what beauty. Perfection. The seal of greatness. Not a flaw. Not nothing wrong with him. He was the God of music in heaven, I guess. I, you know, someone else might help me with that. But, and so you can understand why rock and roll today is becoming so perverted and twisted. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the pearl, the onyx, the jasper, the left piss, and the lazul, the turquoise, the emerald, and the, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed. Cherub. I think you had the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then you had Lucifer and Michael and worked your way on down the ladder. So here we are. Right there. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You had arrived, and you don't get no better than that. I mean, no God's not going to share his glory with nobody. You walked into the midst of the stones of the fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. There was no unrighteousness in you. Nothing found wrong about you whatsoever. You were created perfect. There was nothing wrong. You were not. You were. Uh, you don't get no better than that. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. You sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering with cherubim from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up. Became arrogant, prideful, conceited because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of splendor. I cast you to the ground. So here, I don't know how all this happened, but somewhere here, it don't get no better than that. Absolute perfection, but somewhere, somehow, pride. He got lofty, he got arrogant, he got high minded, he had an elevated opinion. He decided he wanted to be above God, not just equal with God, but he wanted to actually set his throne up above and higher. Can you imagine the arrogance of that? He actually believed that this was something that was attainable. And God just said, Phew, just cast him down. 
And what's worse than that is he didn't only take himself, but he took a third of the angels with him. So not only did pride get him thrown off the island out of heaven, but it got a third of the angels. Which was a bunch of them. I forget that number, but man, this is, it was an incredible somewhere came, somebody talked about how many that is. There was a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And now we're all down here running around corrupting who? That same nature. And the angels parted. Now they're running around and now we were inherited that same sinful nature. Next thing you know, Satan shows up on a little snake, comes up to Eve's ear. Has God really said? Has God really said? And Satan, uh, Eve starts dialoguing. Should have went to her husband and Adam should have said something. He was right there. He was with her. He was wife under the bus. Wasn't like he was out there working in the garage under the, you know, fishing or something. It says he was elbow to elbow. He was with her. That word actually means Hebrew means elbow to elbow. It means he was right there. You know, and the serpent shows up. God already told Adam, you know, hey, we, we created in your image. You don't get no better than that. God knows in the day you'll be you'll be like him. They're already like God. They couldn't get any more like God. That's like trying to break into your own house when you got keys in your pocket. The temptation was to try to be something that they already are. Now, how does that ring a bell with us? We already created an image of God. We just need to, you know. So anyway, this pride thing takes everybody down. It took, after that, it took Uzziah out. It took Saul out. It took Peter out. Oh, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. Oh, Peter, before the night's over, buddy, that rooster's going to crow, buddy, and you're going to be eating crow. And you know what? It'll take us out, too. Turn to 1 Peter 5, 5-6. We're going to look at the end of it a little bit. First <coughs> Peter 5, 5-6. I don't want to rush through it. And, and, and this is this is the my, this is my message. Oh well. Anyway, it's okay we come back another time? Yeah. All right. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen. 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 Lord, we just thank you tonight. We bless you and praise you. Lord, work that inherent humility and that brokenness in us, Lord. We appreciate you and we need you. We love you, God. Oh God, let us recognize that sin. Let us be teachable, humble. Lord, and, and we just need you, Lord. Work that into the fabric of our beings. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.